it took me, you know, an hour to decode each line of this bill because it's all in acronyms and code numbers and gobbledygook that no one can understand. I mean, I used to think of myself as a fairly intelligent person until I tried to read these bills. Um, the other big charge, one of the big charges, was $13,700 for his first uh, drug treatment, his first transfusion of uh, the anti-cancer drug that he needed, $13,700. Um, and when I followed the money, I found out that this cost MD Anderson approximately uh, $3,000, and it cost the drug company three to $400. I consider myself fairly good at this stuff. I've started a lot of businesses. I've done a lot of business reporting. There is no way you can look at any pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, their filings with the SEC, their filings for IPOs. You look at any of their P&Ls, and R&D doesn't come close to justifying these margins. No way, no how. It doesn't work. In fact, the gross profit margins of the typical pharmaceutical company, the, the successful pharmaceutical company, the gross profit margin is higher than the gross profit margins of software companies, which don't even make and ship a physical product to anybody. Um, so that's a myth. And I, and I discovered that myth just in following the money in this guy's bills. So what I saw in looking at this bill was an overall economy that just um, seems sort of otherworldly. For example, MD Anderson, by charging all those prices, including that markup on uh, the drug, ends up, ended up in that year with an operating profit of $531 million, which is a 26% operating profit margin. Not bad for a nonprofit. Um, the president of the hospital, it, it turns out, made two and a half times what the chancellor of the Texas University system makes. And MD Anderson is part of the Texas University system. Um, then I sort of looked a little further, again, just using that bill, and I just looked at a bunch of other schools, and you see um, the same thing, where if you name a, if you name a university, and name a hospital that's part of the university, whether it's Duke, Yale, Harvard, uh, UCLA, Stanford, I guess the university's here, I haven't looked, but I'll bet. Um, the president of the hospital typically makes two to three times as much as the president of the university. Why is that? Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the second bill I looked at. This was a woman who had had um, what she thought uh, were chest pains while eating dinner in her home um, in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, she was taken to the hospital, um, and $21,000 later, uh, she was told that it was indigestion. Um, she paid $199.50 for a blood test that Medicare would have paid $13.94 for. And by the way, the reason she paid was she was employed at a chain store um, that also had, you know, actually she was um, on COBRA, um, and her COBRA policy um, uh, had a limit of X dollars you know, per stay. So she was on the hook too, as are millions of Americans, although not so many um, with the implementation of uh, the president's health care reforms. So she was charged $199.50 for a blood test that Medicare would have paid $13.94 for, she was given, and it's not clear if she really needed this, a special um, CAT scan using a radioactive dye instead of uh, the stress test that other doctors said might have been uh, sufficient in this case. Um, and that cost $7,997. Uh, Medicare would have paid $554 for it. Um, and the whole use of CAT scans and MRIs in, I mean, emergency rooms, I found, again, from just looking through the window of this bill, has become um, just massive. Uh, part of that is um, the need for malpractice reform, for tort reform. It is, um, um, as one hospital executive said to me, if someone comes into the emergency room and says the word head, even if they say, I've got a 
head to the bathroom, um, we give them a CAT scan uh, because that way we can't get sued. Now, part of that may be an excuse to give more CAT scans, which were enormously profitable, and part of that may be real, but uh, malpractice reform would really cut that. You know, I like to think, for example, that um, uh, uh, the trial bar and, in fact, uh, the teachers' unions, or, or used to be the teachers' unions, but it certainly still is the trial bar, is to the Democratic Party what you know, the NRA is to the Republican Party. You can't get Democrats to admit that the tort reform is a real issue, and it plays out probably to the tune of 4 or 5% of our health care costs in the United States, which, if you're taking 4 or 5% of uh, you know, $2.8 trillion, actually adds up. Um, so let's take another bill. Um, near Stanford, Connecticut, uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, a little further to the north, a hospital owned by Yale New Haven Hospital, a part-time school bus driver um, who fell in her backyard um, and $9,100 later with two stitches under her eye. She was sent from the emergency room, but not before she was billed and sued until she paid $239 for that $199 blood test in Stanford, which again, Medicare <coughs> pays only $13 for. Um, her total bill again was $9,400, and Yale New Haven sued her and collected every penny of it. Now at Yale New Haven, by the way, the hospital president makes $2.5 million. The president of Yale University, a fairly complicated place, uh, makes 1.6 million. When I asked the hospital spokesman about that, um, he said with a sort of straight face that uh, running Yale New Haven is a lot more, you know, a lot more complicated than running Yale University. Um, so then I asked him about uh, uh, the Greenwich Hospital, which Yale New Haven also owns, which is like 100 beds. It's basically the size of this room. Um, and, the, and the president of Greenwich Hospital, owned by Yale New Haven, makes um, $100,000 more than the president of Yale University. This is this alternate universe. In fact, the president of Greenwich Hospital makes $33 for every patient day in that hospital. So you check into Greenwich Hospital for three days, you're giving that guy $99. Your bill is going to be a lot more, but that guy gets $99. Um, so no one could really explain any uh, this stuff to me. It was, as if, it was as if I was asking questions that they'd never had to explain. Um, and they really hadn't because um, they certainly don't have to explain this to their customers because their customers have no choice in what they pay. They don't have to explain because they have all the information and all the power. This is not really a free market. It's a market where the sellers have all the information and the sellers have all the power. Um, it's really no marketplace at all if you define a marketplace, again, as involving buyers and sellers who enter into transactions with each other with something approaching some balance of power. Again, in the healthcare marketplace, the buyer has no price information. Right? That woman from Bridgeport didn't know what she was going to do. It's not like she woke up one morning and said, gee, I think I'll wander down to the emergency room at Bridgeport Hospital and see what they have on sale today. And you know, see if I want to buy it. You know, she didn't know any of that. Didn't have any choice. It's where she was taken. And if she had a lot of price information, she didn't have any leverage to do anything about it. She's sitting in the emergency room. She's bleeding from the face. She doesn't know if it's serious or non-serious. The ambulance took her there. Um, that's all she knew. So I think that it was important in this article, you know, to tell Americans. Um, about that, which is something that probably many sort of know from their own experience. And that is that this system makes no sense, that it's often infuriating and incredibly destructive to the people who are involved in it or who have to be involved in it. I mean, how else would you characterize a supposedly nonprofit hospital's charge of $13,700 uh, forced on an uninsured small business owner whose family income is approximately $40,000. $13,700 so that he could get his first dose of a cancer drug, 
that, that cost the hospital 3000 and cost the drug company a few hundred dollars. How else could you characterize a system like that? How else could you explain a $995 four-mile ambulance ride? That was the woman uh, from Bridgeport. Or an $87,000 bill to a construction worker for a few hours of outpatient care. That bill, by the way, included $3 for the magic marker that marked the spot on his back where a neurostimulator would be inserted. You know, the magic marker, you know, where they put the X to make sure that I'm put on the wrong side of the back. Presumably they can reuse the marker, right? But $3 for the marker. He was then charged $49,000 for the neurostimulator, which cost the hospital approximately $30,000. That $30,000 was in turn paid to a company whose gross profit margin is nearly double apples. Now think about that. The neurostimulator is a high-tech piece of equipment. The stuff Apple makes is high-tech um, equipment. We all think of Apple as this incredible profit margin machine. And they look like nothing compared to this medical device company. So as I followed the money and discovered, for example, that the Oklahoma City Hospital, where that $87,000 outpatient care, the guy with the neurostimulator in his back, where that $87,000 outpatient care took place, I discovered that it's part of a highly profitable $4.2 billion a chain of hospitals ironically named the Sisters of Mercy. I think ultimately uh, you have to start with transparency. Transparency is a good thing, but from transparency, when you get a real look at it, what you see is that this experiment that we began in this country where we decided that we were going to be the only developed country in the world that was going to leave health care to the free market, um, that experiment hasn't worked. Uh, we need market interference because there is no free market. And that market interference can take the form of price controls at hospitals, of states forcing hospitals to charge everyone the same amount for everything, as Maryland now sort of does. Um, it can take the form, should take the form, of uh, controlling the price of uh, monopoly drugs, where a crucial drug, where someone has a patent on it, um, that uh, the $13,000 drug that I describe here, uh, that drug company gets four or $5,000 for it all over Europe, and they make a ton of money on, on it there, and they market it there as avidly as they can. Um, why should we be different? Uh, why are we different? We tried this experiment. It's not an experiment. We've prided ourselves on it, and what we've ended up with are costs that are strangling us and results that indicate that we really don't have anything to show for it. So here's the, a very basic question from the audience. How can we change? What power do American healthcare consumers have under the current model? Any power? How can we change? Well, I, I think it's going to take a public revolt. I mean, the, the idea, let me give you such a, sort of one example of, a, of a, an outrage that's so outrageous that you just wonder why people aren't marching on Washington. Um, Medicare is really efficient. Where it's not efficient is where Congress has intervened. For example, Congress decided, because a bunch of congressmen, frankly, just got bought off, that Medicare, the largest consumer of health care on the planet, Medicare alone is not allowed to negotiate the price of drugs. Medicare is not allowed to negotiate the price of durable medical equipment. Um, they've let them have these little tiny pilot prices. It's just... Free market 101. Um, big buyer should be able to negotiate the price. So what's an example? Uh, one of my patients got a cane um, that Medicare paid $24 for that you can buy at Walmart uh, for $11. Now, it doesn't sound like much, except Medicare buys you know, 900,000 of those canes every year, so it adds up. Uh, you know, for pharmaceuticals, we could save $6 billion a year on health care costs just by allowing, uh, just by getting rid of the legislation that Congress intervened in and said, Medicare, you, unlike everybody else, cannot participate in a free market economy by negotiating the price of what you pay. Now, that's a small example. The larger examples are um, 
hospitals tax exempt status. Um, if you, you know, if you're the city of Stanford, in addition to the hospital making a lot of money, it owns all this real estate that it's not paying any taxes on. Um, I just think sooner or later there is going to be a public revolt, and then we will get to a point where the best form of public revolt would be if C-SPAN would only do this. Every time there's a hearing about healthcare, you could say this for any other industry, every time there's a hearing about healthcare, um, underneath the name of the senator or congressman, in parentheses should just be how much money they've taken from the healthcare lobby whenever they're talking. Um, I was asked to testify at uh, a hearing of uh, the Senate Finance Committee, and I testified at the end. I said, you know, you, you know, the Democrats on the committee have gotten, I forget, you know, twenty-one million dollars in the last four years, and you, uh, uh, you know, you, Senator, um, I forget who uh, the ranking member was. You and your colleagues on the Republican side have gotten twenty-two million dollars. Um, why don't you just disclose it? Why don't you just put that under your name tag right there? If, because the hearing was about health care transparency. I said, now here's some transparency that would really help. Um, the only, they, they all got really angry. The only one in the room who laughed, who thought, who thought, thought it was a good idea, uh, was your very own Michael Bennett. I just answered the second question in, in my hand. Um, how accurate is the perception that policymakers are beholden, and in what ways are they beholden? Are they literally saying, I'll put up a stop sign in front of anything that hurts you? You know, you can answer that question, you know, let's pick an issue. Education, tax reform, you know, what's our favorite issue of the, of the day? Certainly health reforms, uh, the, you know, I think most Americans have the sense that stuff doesn't get done because the special interests are there. Healthcare is it, it, it is sort of the the epitome of the problem, or, 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 or almost a caricature of the problem, because the numbers are so big, it affects everybody. Everybody understands it, and you would think that everybody would want to do something about it, but nothing happens. And the triumph of Obamacare again. There's a lot of really good stuff in Obamacare, and it's going to cost all of us in this, in this room a lot of money. Um, but Obamacare doesn't go at the issue of why stuff costs so much. It's just about who gets to pay for it. There are some reforms sort of at the edges. It penalizes hospitals for, um, uh, you know, for readmissions. But Obamacare is good legislation. But then again, parts of the administration, particularly the Treasury Department, are just woefully incompetent when it comes to just enforcing the law. Part of Obamacare. Uh, you know, the stuff in my article about hospitals, uh, you know, suing people into bankruptcy. There's a great provision in Obamacare that says that as of March 2010, the Secretary of the Treasury can write regulations that as a condition of hospitals getting their tax exemption, their 501c3 status, they must present a plan for how they're going to offer financial aid to people before they sue them, and they can't sue them except when they've done this aggressive outreach to them first to offer them financial aid, and when they sue them, if they're poor, they, ha they can charge no more than the average that they get from all their insurance companies and Medicare, meaning all, you know, the people in my article who got sued for Chargemaster, that can never happen. Great little paragraph in Obamacare, wonderful paragraph. Secretary of the Treasury, you know, that genius Timothy Geithner or Jack Lew or Peter Orzak, any of them, could have written, a monkey could write that regulation in three paragraphs in a half hour. They still have not written that regulation. The hospitals are still not banned. They are still suing people into bankruptcy. Go figure. Wow. I was interested to hear how you got started just being curious about it. I came at it the same way, um, and I can thank the Colorado Health Foundation and uh, the Colorado Trust for helping me start to learn about healthcare along the way. And also another journalist I know you know, T.R. Reed, who uh, looked at these systems in other countries. Is it possible, do you think, it, it seems to me that he said Switzerland and or Germany had a referendum that, that squeaked by. I mean, nobody wanted it. It was in like the more modern economic times. So what I'm saying is, do you think that we could, as a country, decide that we want the government to say, regulate prices at some level. Well, we could do that, but uh, but to do 
the, to do to replicate the system that a lot of countries in Europe has, um, you'd have to throw a lot of people in this room out of work. Um, anyone who's in the health insurance industry is gone in that situation. Um, and that's a lot of people in a lot of places in a very big industry. And you know, I think the president was realistic and right about that. You, you, we, we can't do that. The only way we could ultimately do that is if there is a real public rebellion over costs. And when we go through Obamacare and we see that, yes, we've done a lot of really good things. We're now protecting more people, but the cost is still a great burden. We will start to, to, you know, to trim away at that, but we'll never re rewrite the system into a single payer system. There's just too much. Uh, it, it, it's just it's too big. It's just, I, I don't know of any government that's done anything like that ever in any context. Down then at the consumer level, should um, people start taking a, their overnight bag full of you know gauze pads and? <laughs> a cane and anything they might need, the box of Tylenol, and just saying, I'm not paying your prices? I don't know. I mean, it may be like, um, I don't know about here, but you know, when you go to the movies where I live um, outside New York City, there's a big sign you can't bring your own soda in. You know, uh, maybe they wouldn't let you. I don't think the issue is, you know, the charge master is emblematic of just how crazy, irrational, and unaccountable the system is. But the issue, especially post-Obamacare, where many more people are going to have insurance, and if Jack Lou ever gets around to it, there'll be a regulation that doesn't allow them to sue for charge master prices. Um, post Obamacare, the real issue isn't the charge master. The real issue, the real transparency issue is, I want to know, I, I'd like to know, if I have you know, Aetna insurance, and I read that, okay, from where I live, New York Hospital and Mount Sinai and NYU Medical Center are all in the Aetna network. So I figure, all good. My wife's giving birth, I can go to any one of those three hospitals. Well, it turns out I'm gonna co-pay and they're gonna pay radically different prices in those three hospitals. Well, that's one thing I'd like to know. The second thing I'd like to know is if I have Aetna and someone else has Blue Cross Blue Shield, they may, the, the insurance companies have different deals with the same hospital. So I want to know, you know, if I'm buying insurance, it's one thing to tell me what my premium's going to be, but it's another thing to tell me, especially with much higher deductibles these days and much higher, you know, coinsurance, um, which insurance company has the best deals with the hospital I want to go to, not just that it's in network. And that is a great transparency frontier because the insurance companies will never want to give up that information because once you give up that information, once you know what, you know, hospital A charges, you know, what its lowest charge is to a big insurance company, then that's the charge that you charge every insurance company. And then what do you need insurance companies for? Uh, Michelle Leak with the Colorado Health Institute. I'm curious about your comments about Medicare being an efficient buyer. And is that a... Um, mechanism or something we should try and replicate in the private market? And can you to comment a little bit on the efficiency of a buyer vis-a-vis -vis the Colorado exchange that we're building here for consumers? I'm probably not going to be so good on commenting about the latter because I have an unusual habit for a reporter, especially one with a microphone, who's holding a microphone. I always try to say I don't know something when I don't know something, and I don't know enough about that. Um, what I can say is this, one of the, one of the questions I've, I had as I was doing the article and still have is to me, creating more competition among insurance companies, i.e. the exchanges, is not the answer because what I saw was that the providers have all this concentrated power and it's almost like if you could wave a magic wand, you'd say, all right, let's have two insurance companies in the United States and they'll, they'll have a duopoly and then let's let them bargain with all the providers and they'll threaten providers into lowering uh, their prices. What you have in most places, let's take you know, New Haven, Connecticut, a place I know. Um, they've bought up a ton of the doctor's practices. They own the Bridgeport Hospital. They basically, they own Greenwich Hospital. They're, they basically 
are the health care provider. They bought St. Raphael's Hospital, the only other hospital in New Haven, so they're the health care provider. So if you want to sell insurance in and around New Haven, Connecticut, and this is probably true in Oklahoma City and you know, for all I know here, but you got to deal with Yale New Haven. So the idea that, oh, if only we had 10 insurance companies negotiating with Yale New Haven instead of three, the world would be a better place, just doesn't seem logical to me. Because Yale New Haven, the seller, can say, hey, you know, um, if you can't provide Yale New Haven services in your insurance, you can't sell insurance around here. So we don't want to make a deal with you because you're asking us you know, for price concessions that we don't want to give. So and that, to me, is a genuine mystery. And when I ran that past um, the Obamacare people, their explanation was that that's probably right, but the good thing about the exchanges is it will make consumer-friendly insurance more available to people than it is today. I mean, and I think that's true. Now, I will tell you that I looked at the form for one state, which isn't Colorado. I think Colorado really looks terrific. Um, but there's another state where my wife and I went on and we made believe we wanted to buy insurance for our 28-year-old daughter. Now, between my wife and me, we have uh, Yale College degrees and Yale Law School degrees. So we're sort of halfway intelligent. Um, and we could not figure out anything about that website, anything about how to buy that insurance. Still, now this is the exchange. But uh, Colorado, not true. It's really clear stuff. Um, so I think that's one of the benefits of the exchange is it'll pull more people in in a consumer-friendly way. They'll understand what they're buying. But the basic economic question is power of buyer versus power of seller. And I think in so many places there is so much consolidation of seller that uh, increasing the competition among the buyers, the insurance companies, I don't think that's going to yield really terrific results. Now, I may be wrong about that. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but I ran that by a lot of people because it seemed, it ultimately became so counterintuitive to me that, the, that what you really want to be is the feature of the program is more competition among insurance companies. One of the fun things about your book, uh, your, your, your journey about um, education reform was you made a personal pivot in, in your mindset, apparently. Uh, as you went through the process. Did you have any epiphanies or changes in opinion from the working hypothesis of what the article was? I'm really glad you asked that. I, I should have said that. Thank, thank you. Um, completely. I mean, I approached this, and, and you mentioned the education book. When I approached this at the beginning, you know, why does this stuff cost so much? I had just written a lot about education and education reform. And in some ways, it's a similar issue. You, you know, K-12 to education, largely a monopoly. Um, K to 12 education, we spend two or three times per capita what other countries spend. Our results are much worse. Why is that? Well, the answer in education is the unions, pretty much the core answer, and then bureaucracy and a lot of other stuff, but it's basically we've let the unions take over the education system, and in places like Colorado where, uh, you know, the reform movement has uh, you know, featured accountability and, you know, measuring, you know, performance. Uh, you know, why shouldn't you want to measure the performance of the most important workers in our country, um, the teachers, when you measure performance for, you know, for sales clerks at Walmart? Um, so I went into this thing, well, maybe it's the hospital unions uh, or maybe it's, you know, some combination of the hospital unions and the AMA who have a stranglehold. Uh, and that's why. So that's sort of what I was looking at going in because that was sort of my knee-jerk expectation, and it's ridiculous. In fact, the, the opposite is true. The only people not on this gravy train are the doctors and the nurses. The people who actually provide the care are not on this gravy train. I mean, we have built an alternate island um, economy in this country called healthcare where everybody's getting rich, and nobody's accountable, and it's sucking the life out of the rest of the economy. Uh, 